Making movies is a gamble, and some productions are simply dealt losing hands. Whether they were impacted by the pandemic or just didn't get enough butts in seats, these recent films flopped at the box office, but that doesn't mean they're not worth your time. When it was announced that James Gunn would be helming 2021's The Suicide Squad, some fans thought that it would end up making more money than the critically hated film that came out five years earlier. Sadly, however, this was far from the case. Warner Brothers spent $185 million producing the film and an estimated $100 million in marketing, but it only brought in a total of $168 million at the box office worldwide. Profitable or not, The Suicide Squad is still a violent good time. Its R rating allows for some creatively bloody death sequences and plenty of profanity, but it still has the same humor and heart that made Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy so popular. Standout characters include Sylvester Stallone's adorably deadly King Shark, David Desmulchin's self-loathing Polka Dot Man, and John Cena's stubbornly intense Peacemaker, the latter of whom even got his own spin-off show. Of course, the true star of the show is Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, who takes out an entire palace full of guards in one delightfully twisted sequence. It may not have blown up the box office, but The Suicide Squad is still one of the better DC films of the 2020s so far. Considering its 90% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes, there's no denying that it deserved much more success. No one likes to show off. Unless what they're showing off is dope as f When it was released on March 6, 2020, the Pixar film Onward fared pretty well at the box office at first, then COVID-19 happened. Once it became impossible to ignore the looming threat of the pandemic, moviegoers began staying home, quickly putting a massive dent in Disney's ticket sales. On its second weekend, Onward grossed only $10.5 million, a record-breaking 74% drop from its opening weekend. Given that the film cost $200 million to produce, its box office haul of $141.9 million was not enough to make it profitable. But that doesn't mean that Onward is a bad movie by any means. After all, it has everything viewers have come to expect from Pixar movies – a unique concept, quality animation, and a whole lot of heart. Observant fans will recognize the voices of Marvel movie veterans Tom Holland and Chris Pratt as lovable elf brothers Ian and Barley Lightfoot, and they make for a perfect buddy comedy duo. In fact, there are lots of memorable characters in this urban fantasy world from a tavern manager manticore to a gang of pixie bikers with a bone to pick with our heroes. Of course, this film has more than just laughs to offer. Thanks to the movie's bittersweet ending, Onward will hit you in the feels right when you least expect it. When an indie movie costs only $5 million to make, you'd think there's no way it can lose. But 2023's Blackberry did exactly that. The film earned just $1.6 million worldwide proving that you don't need to spend a fortune on a project for it to flop at the box office. Elevation Pictures lost only a few million dollars, which is nothing compared to higher-profile bombs, but this savvy little tech comedy deserved better. Regardless of how much money BlackBerry made, it's a must-see. Unlike The Social Network and other biopics that take viewers behind the scenes of a major technological innovation, BlackBerry doesn't show an industry giant's humble origins. Instead, the movie places everything in perspective for audiences, who already know going in that the BlackBerry will go the way of the floppy disk. Watching a tech empire fall apart is arguably more riveting than seeing its rise, after all. Although BlackBerry has several moving parts, the film keeps its focus small, zeroing in on the main cast of characters who got the BlackBerry off the ground. Jay Baruchel is excellent as the tech expert behind the once popular line of handheld devices, and Glenn Howerton is perfect as the ruthless businessman who helped him conquer the world before it all collapsed around them. You think I won't do it? I'm from Waterloo, where the vampires hang out! After the smash success of Hamilton on Broadway and Disney+, Plus, it seemed reasonable to expect Lin-Manuel Miranda's first musical, In the Heights, to be a success when it made the jump to the big screen. Alas, this was not the case, as the film couldn't make back its budget. Some observers speculated that the slump in ticket sales was because movie musicals no longer have sway over audiences. But the fact that the film debuted simultaneously on HBO Max may also have had something to do with it. 
With an excellent cast and a Rotten Tomatoes score well over 90%, In the Heights certainly deserved better. The film is largely faithful to the Broadway musical about the people of the New York neighborhood of Washington Heights, with a few additions. There are several new characters, an adorable framing device, and a tragic plotline involving one character's status as an undocumented immigrant. In the Heights takes full advantage of its medium, translating the iconic dance numbers of the original musical into visually dazzling sequences on the big screen. One song manages to capture an entire life, while another features a couple dancing on the side of a building. As fun as the stage version is, the film adaptation of In the Heights manages to go above and beyond. $384 million is a lot of money. And since that's the amount that Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny made on a $300 million budget, it seems like the producers at least managed to break even. However, that's not accounting for the cost of marketing. Some sources estimate that Lucasfilm spent anywhere from $65 million to $200 million promoting the movie, including $7 million just to purchase a Super Bowl TV spot. That made the fifth Indiana Jones movie a box office disappointment, especially when compared to Indy's earlier adventures. That doesn't mean it's a bad movie, not by a long shot. Harrison Ford doesn't let his advanced age stop him from playing everyone's favorite archaeologist, and he makes it an important part of Indy's character. Phoebe Waller-Bridge plays Helena, Indy's whip-smart goddaughter, and she makes for a solid companion in a mission that will determine the course of the future and the past. There are also cameos from some of Indiana's colleagues from his previous journeys, including Marion and Sala. The joy of seeing these familiar faces again is mixed with a twinge of sadness, as we know their glory days are long behind them. And I miss waking up every morning wondering what wonderful adventure the new day will bring to us. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny may not always strike the right balance between homage and originality, but it certainly makes a valiant effort. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny wasn't the only box office flop of June 2023. The Flash also performed terribly, earning just $270 million worldwide. That kind of haul would be unbelievably impressive for an indie film like BlackBerry, but for one of the final films in the DC Extended Universe, it was a paltry sum. The production budget of The Flash was $200 million, plus around $150 million for marketing. In other words, it lost a mountain of money. The Flash isn't exactly the best multiverse movie. In fact, it's not even the best multiverse movie of 2023, as Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse debuted just two weeks prior. Still, The Flash is loads of fun, and if you're not comparing it to one of the greatest superhero movies of all time, it actually holds up. Ezra Miller shines in not one but two leading roles, playing both older and younger versions of Barry Allen. Sure, the time travel mechanics make zero sense, but if you're willing to go along with the tangled mess of a plot, it offers plenty of laughs and raises some thought-provoking questions as Barry begins to understand the consequences of his meddling. Besides, all the plot holes in the world are totally worth it to see Michael Keaton don the Batsuit once more. Movie studios don't need to pour $300 million into a movie to end up with a box office bomb. Sometimes, even low-budget comedies can become major financial failures. Take the 2022 rom-com Bros. Universal Pictures only invested $22 million in the film, yet it only made a total of $11 million at the domestic box office. Relatively speaking, it didn't cost Universal as much money as larger-scale flops do, but a loss is still a loss. Regardless, Bros is good, not-so-clean fun. While Bros isn't the first mainstream comedy to feature a gay couple in leading roles, it does mark the first rom-com from a major studio to get a theatrical release with an almost entirely queer cast. This cheeky comedy is willing to poke fun at just about everybody. It cleverly satirizes Hollywood, pokes fun at pickup lines, and jokes about infighting in the LGBTQ community. This happens to be Bisexual Awareness Week, and no one has acknowledged it! I acknowledge That is true, my bad. Despite being a comedy, Bros also has plenty of emotional heft. Viewers' hearts will go out to sarcastic podcast host Bobby as he learns to open up and allow himself to be loved. When Gladiator director Ridley Scott announced that he would helm another historical epic, fans understandably got excited. The last duel seemed like a sure bet, but when it stepped up to joust against Halloween kills on its opening weekend, 
Scott's film died a horrible death at the box office. Even after factoring in the international earnings, the movie earned back less than one-third of its budget, a poor showing for such an accomplished filmmaker. Why did it stumble? Perhaps viewers expected a bloody, macho battle more in line with Gladiator. Instead, the movie's marketing was a little bit misleading. Matt Damon and Adam Driver's duelists are no heroes, and the real protagonist is Jodie Comer's Marguerite. After she is brutally assaulted, a duel will decide whether her assailant will face justice or walk free. The same sequence of events is depicted from the perspectives of three different characters, but it's quickly apparent who's telling the truth and who's deluding themselves. For those who simply wanted chivalry and carnage, The Last Duel was a disappointment, but if you're looking for a mature medieval drama, it's definitely worth a watch. If you want to split hairs, Pixar's Lightyear technically earned back its production budget of $200 million, but it didn't break even. Factor in marketing costs and the fact that theaters get a percentage of all ticket sales, and it becomes clear that Lightyear was not the least bit profitable for Pixar. Chief Creative Officer Pete Docter reflected on what Pixar could learn from the film's failure, telling the rap, I think there was a disconnect between what people wanted slash expected and what we were giving to them. Viewers hope to see more of the Toy Story characters they've come to love, but there's no Woody, Jesse, or Mr. Potato Head to be found. Instead, Lightyear is a movie about the astronaut that the Buzz Lightyear toy was apparently based on. It was a bold idea, and it turned out to be a bit too convoluted for audiences to appreciate. Lightyear is considered by many to be one of the lesser Pixar movies, but it's still a quality outing from one of the most trusted studios in animation. While Chris Evans can't quite replace Tim Allen as Buzz himself, he still does a fine job of portraying the uptight space ranger who learns to loosen up. Director George Miller is a master of all genres. After delighting children with his story of a dancing penguin in Happy Feet and its sequel, he returned to the wasteland for the action-packed epic Mad Max Fury Road. Fans weren't sure whether to expect talking animals or exploding cars in his next production, but they ended up getting neither. Instead, they watched Tilda Swinton fall in love with Jin Idris Elba in the surreal fantasy comedy 3,000 Years of Longing. I like it. Whatever it is, I'm sure it has an interesting story. Unfortunately, Miller's first film in seven years was nowhere near as lucrative as Mad Max Fury Road. Against a $60 million budget, 3,000 Years of Longing made a measly $8 million at the domestic box office, and its international gross wasn't much better. Experts say that the film might have fared better if it had opened at only a handful of theaters before sweeping outward. That would have allowed time for the film to gain traction from positive word of mouth, a strategy that worked wonders for everything everywhere all at once that same year. 3,000 Years of Longing may not feature war boys and machine guns, but it still captures the same anarchic energy as Mad Max Fury Road. For a film with a main narrative that takes place almost entirely in a single hotel room, 3,000 Years of Longing does an amazing job of taking viewers on a dazzling journey through time and space. The Northman is a slippery film to categorize. Is it an indie film with the budget of a blockbuster, or a blockbuster with the production values of an indie? The film's genre-defying nature might have been one of the reasons why it bombed at the box office. Moviegoers just weren't sure what to make of it. Despite a budget of $90 million, plus no small sum invested in advertising, The Northman earned only $69 million at the box office worldwide. That's a shame, as this film from director Robert Eggers is truly stunning. Fans of Eggers' previous films, The Witch and The Lighthouse, will adore The Northman. This visceral movie isn't for the faint of heart, but it's expertly crafted in all its gruesome glory. The world Eggers creates feels tactile and gritty, more real than anything else seen in other fantasy epics. And his devotion to keeping the Northmen historically accurate is astounding. Critics have said that the film manages to be both modern and timeless, displaying a contemporary sensibility despite telling a story that's been around for thousands of years. The bleak and brutal tone of The Northmen may not be for everyone, but Eggers commits so deeply to its aesthetic that you can only watch with slack-jawed awe. Realistic drama films aren't often expected to earn a whole lot of money, but Warner Brothers was likely expecting a decent haul from King Richard thanks to the star power of Will Smith. The $50 million movie earned only $15 million at the domestic box office, plus an additional $24 million overseas. 
It doesn't take a mathematician to figure out that doesn't add up. King Richard needed to compete against the immensely popular Ghostbusters Afterlife, and its simultaneous release on HBO Max may have also funneled viewers away from the theater. Although the movie's reputation tends to be overshadowed by the notorious slap, the truth is that King Richard is an intimate and honest movie with a central performance deserving of the Academy Award for Best Actor. It's a fresh take on the sports biopic, focusing less on the young Williams sisters and more on their father and unofficial coach working behind the scenes. Smith throws himself wholeheartedly into the lead role, embracing the character's devotion to his daughters and the immense pressure he places on them. Although we never get to see the sisters earn any of their numerous Grand Slam titles, King Richard is even more poignant because we know how it's going to end with two inspiring champions. Venus and Serena going to shake up this world. If you want to see a 2022 film about naval aviators doing jaw-dropping stunts with Glenn Powell in a supporting role, Top Gun Maverick is probably what you're looking for. But surprisingly, that's not the only movie that fits that description. Six months after Maverick hit theaters and broke a billion dollars, Devotion was released, and it promptly crashed and burned. Despite its sizable $90 million budget, it only brought in a bit under $22 million when all was said and done. It's easy to write it off as a copycat flick, but Devotion wasn't made to capitalize on the Top Gun hype. Instead, it tells the true story of an American hero that far too few people know about. Played by Jonathan Majors, Jesse Brown is a black pilot serving in the U.S. military during the Korean War. This inspiring story doesn't shy away from addressing racism and other flaws in military culture. Instead, it explores how soldiers are trained to repress their emotions, especially Brown, who finds himself afraid to show any weakness as the only black man in his unit. Brown may not have the same charisma as Tom Cruise's Pete Maverick Mitchell, but Majors more than makes up for it in dramatic weight. If you appreciate history, airplanes, and quality filmmaking, then Devotion might just be the movie for you. The year 2022 was not a good one for animated films at Disney. After the failure of Lightyear, Disney suffered another financial loss with the film Strange World, costing $180 million to produce and likely an additional $90 million to market. Strange World made only $73 million at the worldwide box office and drained the studio of an estimated $197 million. Given the popularity of Moana and Frozen, it's understandable that audiences were a bit disappointed to learn that Strange World doesn't contain any show-stopping musical numbers. Even Raya and the Last Dragon, which doesn't have a single song in its runtime, features elements still familiar to Disney fans, fantasy kingdoms and animal sidekicks. Fairy tale musicals may be what Walt Disney Animation Studios does best, but they deserve credit for trying to branch out into other genres. Right from its opening sequence, Strange World pays homage to pulpy adventure comics. At the same time, it deconstructs the genre's conventions, asking why the heroes of these stories need to conquer mountains or tame seas in the first place. The protagonist of Strange World just wants to be a farmer and his son cares more about maintaining balance in the ecosystem than discovering new lands. Someone forgot to weed the North Field. Father, what is a weed other than a plant growing somewhere that you find inconvenient? There's lots of colorful world building, from steampunk airships to trippy creatures, and also a surprisingly nuanced commentary on humanity's relationship with nature. Strange World arguably may not deliver what Disney fans hoped for, but it still takes the animation studio in a fresh direction. Despite having a budget of $100 million and Steven Spielberg's name attached, West Side Story barely earned back three quarters of its production budget. Whether it's because the film had to compete against Spider-Man No Way Home, or because viewers were too busy comparing it to the original to appreciate it, West Side Story failed to make a profit. Regardless, folks who skipped it in theaters missed out. In the 2021 version of West Side Story, audiences who got to see the musical on the big screen witnessed the story on a scale they had never seen before. The film boasts some jaw-dropping sets, from the streets of Manhattan to the warehouse where the jets and sharks rumble. There's no correct side in the war between gangs. Mike Feist's riff is a scruffy, pathetic boy you can't help but feel sorry for while David Alvarez's Bernardo shines as a loyal brother who can't stop getting into fights. 
Rachel Ziegler shines as Maria, who knocks it out of the park in her film debut, and Ariana DeBose commands every scene she's in as Anita. DeBose took home the Best Supporting Actress Oscar for her efforts, and when you see Spielberg's adaptation of the classic musical, you'll understand why. Whether you're a longtime fan of the Stephen Sondheim musical or you've never experienced his bold take on Romeo and Juliet, the 2021 West Side Story has something for everyone to enjoy. When Christopher Nolan tried to get movie theaters back in action with Tenant in August 2020, it likely cost Warner Brothers as much as $100 million. The movie's underwhelming returns convinced Warner Brothers to release movies in theaters and streaming services simultaneously prompting Nolan to break ties with the studio. The unfortunate tenant earnings also rippled out to impact other blockbuster releases. Warner Brothers pushed back Wonder Woman 1984 by a couple of months, while Candyman and Black Widow were delayed until 2021. Tenet may not be Nolan's best work, but like many of his other films, it's a deliberately crafted mind game. The director experimented with time manipulation in his films Memento and Interstellar, but Tennant manages to crank those ideas to the max. It's a showcase of Nolan's biggest strengths and weaknesses, and that makes it a must-see for any Nolan fan who's somehow managed to avoid it until now. From backward car chases to reverse bungee jumping, it's easy to get a headache trying to unravel all of the time travel mechanics. If you thought that Inception was confusing, Tenet is on another level. But if you take the advice of Clemence Poesi's character Barbara and just enjoy the vibes, you'll have a good time. Don't try to understand it. Feel it. When Searchlight Pictures invested $60 million in Nightmare Alley, it was perfectly reasonable for them to assume that the film would be a huge hit. After all, Guillermo del Toro had directed several box office successes, including Pacific Rim and the Best Picture winning The Shape of Water. However, this tentpole film about a carnival con artist collapsed in on itself like a circus tent, earning only $39 million worldwide. Perhaps audiences were disappointed it wasn't a dark fairy tale like Del Toro's most iconic works. There are no magical creatures or fantasy elements in Nightmare Alley. Although Bradley Cooper's character Stan claims to have the ability to read minds, he's nothing more than a really clever scammer. Nightmare Alley may not have any kaiju or sexy sea monsters, but there's still plenty to admire about Del Toro's neo-noir film. On the surface, it seems to have nothing in common with his other projects, but if you look a little closer, it's classic Del Toro. The gorgeous set design is on par with Pan's Labyrinth and Crimson Peak, and previous Del Toro collaborators Ron Perlman and Richard Jenkins make appearances. Kate Blanchett is also there, and naturally, she dominates every scene she appears in. Watching Nightmare Alley is a hypnotic experience, as Stan digs himself deeper and deeper into trouble, it's hard to tear your eyes away. Bo is Afraid is another example of an independent director being given a big budget and free reign, yet somehow attracting fewer viewers than his smaller, more indie projects. After the critical and commercial success of Hereditary and Midsummer, A24 offered Ari Aster $35 million to make Bo is Afraid, his biggest budget yet. Unfortunately, the film earned a measly $11 million at the box office. Bo is Afraid is either indulgent or ambitious, depending on who you ask. It's less of a traditional horror movie and more like a surreal dark comedy, which may explain why some fans of his first two films were disappointed. That's not to say it won't send shivers of fear down your spine as Bo encounters and then runs away from some truly unhinged characters. As always, Joaquin Phoenix is in top form. His performance absolutely nails the experience of living with paranoia, as everyone seems to be constantly out to get him. His agonizing odyssey from his dangerous hometown to his mom's house ends in truly unforgettable fashion, featuring one of the biggest WTF movie moments of the decade. If you can handle three hours of anxiety and nervous laughter, Bo is Afraid is definitely worth watching. Perhaps years down the line, horror fans will be returning to this intricate film to unpack all its layers of meaning. Who knows, Bo is Afraid might even earn cult classic status someday.